Hi, I'm Randy Robinson. This is Life Today TV. I have a wonderful guest, a former press secretary for President Bush and current host of The Five on Fox News. Dana Perino is with me. Good to see you. Thanks so much for having me. Glad to be there. I want to mention your book, and the good news is because Lord knows we, we could use a little good news these days. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> yeah, which is kind of ironic because actually with a recent White House correspondence Dinner, they were making fun of Fox News for kind of re over-reporting maybe some of the bad news and being a little dire. And news can be that way, uh, not just Fox News, but all news. What, uh, what good news are you out to share with us? Well, thanks for having me. Um, the good news is um, I was able to write a book. <laughs> I really hadn't written anything longer than a press release or a statement or a speech in my life, but I felt like this was a story that needed to be told. There's a few reasons, um, and I love the title because I'm a naturally optimistic person. I grew up in the West, um, a cattle ranching family. You have to get up before dawn, and you have to have a lot of faith that things are gonna turn out okay. Um, it's also a, some, a phrase that I used to use in the Oval Office a lot because a press secretary, just like on the news, you don't typically go in to see the boss at the end of the day to tell him, everything went perfectly, sir. Um, you go in to see the boss to say, here are the challenges we face today, one, two, three. Usually it had to do with the New York Times. Um, and I always tried to leave on a good note, okay? So I would say, and the good news is, and I would try to have to find something, okay? Sometimes it was, this is how I've tried to handle it. I beat it back, there's a diversion, whatever it might be, and President Bush appreciated that about me, that I didn't come in just with doom and gloom. I would say, here's some good news and how I'm handling it. I learned that from my first chief of staff. Bad news first, good news to, on your way out. Yeah, leave them on a good note, yeah. right. And then the third reason I use that title um, and the good news is, is that I wanted to write about how somebody like me that grew up on a cattle ranch with no political connections could end up at the age of 35 in Washington, D.C. advising the President Bush in the Oval Office and Air Force One and Marine One and that you don't have to have grown up in a big city or go to an elite school or attend an Ivy League university in order to have an experience of a lifetime. And if that includes um, working for the President of the United States, no matter what party it is, I wanted people across the country to know and to be able to tell their children that, that, that it is possible, and I'm a great example of that. Yeah, you've got a lot of great stories. I was reading through the book, um, and you're right. You're not the typical you know, northern, northeastern, yeah. Ivy League school grad. I mean, you, you're a Westerner with and a lot like of people no also think that that I had some sort of special connection. Um, for example, people will say, "Oh, so where in Texas are you from?" I say, "Oh, I'm not from right. Texas. I'm from yeah. Wyoming." And they'll say, "Oh," and they Chaney. just assume that I had some <laughs> sort of funny. personal family connection with the Cheneys and that that's how I got my job. I was the first Republican woman to be press secretary. Um, I didn't think of, about breaking a glass ceiling at that point. I knew it was historically significant and that my life was going to change forever. Um, but we didn't worry too much about breaking glass ceilings when we were at the White House. We just did it. Yeah, and did it quite often. I was surrounded by um, strong women who were the senior staff advising President Bush from legislative affairs, uh, Homeland Security, State Department, uh, transportation, uh, across the board. Uh, we just had some great women that we worked with and just great people. And I was given a lot of advice along the way, even from my early career, uh, people that helped me overcome a lot of anxiety and to remind me about uh, how best to make decisions. And that really included for me going back to my upbringing, which was in the Lutheran church. Yeah, I, I was going to ask you about playing the, the hand bells in, in the <laughs> yeah. Lutheran Church. I was going to try to say with a straight face, too. Oh, but, you uh, and Gutfeld. <laughs> Greg Gutfeld, my co-host on The Five, thinks it is hilarious it that is I was in funny. the handbell choir. But I was really pretty good. I'm sure you were quite good. <laughs> Do you wear the gloves, too? Of course we wore the white gloves, and I, I could do multiple handbells. You put them down and pick them up. Oh, yeah. Well, good for you. Um, <laughs> you okay, so you mentioned that you know, you're not connected you dealt with anxiety, um, and yet you made it to the White House and broke some glass ceilings. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's just, um, you know, luck or your own ambition, or is there some other hand at work here? Okay, so a theme throughout the book, and as I start, sat down to write it, because I will get asked all the time, how did you get to become White House press secretary? And the answer is in this book. 
The theme that I've realized in my life is um, every time I have tried to make a plan, and I'm a planner, I'm a firstborn daughter, and I want to have everything nice and organized and to know exactly where I'm going, my plans have never worked out. <laughs> and this has happened over and over again. And I'm in sure a good way. Heard, yes, and, and, that's, and that's been the good news. Uh, I'm sure you've heard the phrase that if you want to make God laugh, make a plan. Yeah. That is true for me in getting my job at the White House, um, meeting my husband on an airplane and 18 years ago, and we're still together, um, uh, getting my job at the Five. I had, just, I had just been to Nigeria for Voice of America. I'm on my way home. This is after the White House. And I, on the flight, I made the most elaborate plan. It was beautiful. Different colored markers. I knew exactly how I was going to do things. I had a new business. I had some charity work I was doing. And I had a little bit of Fox News. And I'm waiting at baggage claim. And it's taking forever because it's a Washington, D.C., Dulles Airport. And I get a phone call from New York City. And it was from Fox News asking me if I would consider coming up to do a temporary show for six weeks called The Five. And that uprooted all of our plans, but in, a, in the best way. Yeah, sure. It's one of the top programs on the network. Yeah, now. number three um, in all of cable news. Wow. Why do you think that is? Well, not, not the show, but why do you think yeah. your plans never work out and it turns out to be better? Well, I think in some ways humans right, try to organize their life in a way that they feel in control. At least I do. Um, I wouldn't say I'm a control freak because I've learned to let that go yeah. a little bit. But I think it's because also, in a way, having grown up in the West and thinking that everything that I could achieve was actually quite narrow in terms of my horizons, that I didn't ever think I'm going to be the White House press secretary because I thought that was for other people. Right. Um, and so <clears throat> I've had people help me along the way. For example, when I get the job as, as the House press secretary on the Hill, I go to a hockey game because I didn't have any money and it was free. And uh, Coors Brewing Company was actually paying for anyone from Colorado to go. I was new on Capitol Hill. I didn't have that many friends. And I sat down next to this guy named Tim Rutten. <clears throat> and he asked me, so what do you want to do in Washington? And I said, oh, well, I'd love to work my way up to be a House press secretary one day. And he says, oh, well, do you know Congressman Schaefer? Because he's from Colorado. They're looking for somebody from there with any sort of media experience. And I had some. And I said, oh, that wouldn't be right for me to apply for another job because just six weeks ago, this other congressman, Scott McKinnis, asked me to come to Washington. I've only been there six weeks, so that wouldn't be right. It would be wrong for me to leave and get a new job. And he said, are you crazy? This job's perfect for you. And you know what? I was still so fearful about how somebody else would feel about me that, that I had done something wrong that I was still hesitant. And you know what they did? The new congressman, Schaefer, mm -hmm. recognized my anxiety. And instead of making me go through the pain of saying that I really wanted this job as press secretary and I was going to leave the answering phone job, he called the other congressman and said, yeah. we'd like to give her an opportunity. And, you know, they've been my supporters ever since. Do you... And those, that's great. I mean, these, all the stories that are in here are kind of remarkable um, in a lot of ways. Do you, is God working in your life to There's put no you question. in a position to do something, do you think? I think so. I mean, I don't know if I've actually heard a call of saying, you, you should do this. Um, but I do know that I am a kind of person, I, um, maybe I'm not alone. I have a lot of anxiety, uh, fear. Mostly fear, fear of change and fear of failure. It's funny you say that because when I look at what you do and the things you've done, I think, yeah, I, I wouldn't think that. I can mask it very well. Um, when I was in uh, elementary school, I, worked, I lived in Denver, and Denver was one of the first cities to try busing yeah. to integrate the schools. And as I said, I grew up in the Lutheran church, and you know, my sister used to drive my sister crazy that I would ask to go to the early service because if we did that, and Sunday school, we could get home in time for Meet the Press. That's funny. And that's what I really wanted to do. There's My sister would be irritated. Sign right there early, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> but and when, I, when they started the busing, I had to go about 20 miles into Denver. And I was one of only five white children in the school. And none of us were set up for success, okay? So I was bullied, of course, um, teased. I was trying to, how do you fit in? 
Are they call you the white princess? Yeah, the white princess, all sorts of things. But in order to try to fit in, then I would try to adapt. And I tried, I wanted them to like me. And so I used to, I remember, that's when I really started like this rote prayers of, please don't let them be mad at me. Please don't let them be mad at me. And I would just say it over and over again. I didn't tell anybody. Um, and God gets my family through that. And we moved to a rural area um, in Parker, Colorado. I caught back up on my education. It's one of the reasons I've always been a supporter of school choice for parents. <laughs> I guess because so. my parents had the means, barely, to be able to change our situation and get me out of a, a failing school. And that made all the difference to me in, in my life. But there's another point in my life that I would say that God really spoke to me the most, and that was when I go through something, I went through something I call a quarter life crisis. What I didn't realize is that all the other young women around me at that age were going through the same thing. We just didn't talk about it. And it's where you think that all of your childhood dreams are not coming true. You haven't met the man of your dreams. You're not married. You don't have um, the best perfect job and a 401k and all of these things that you thought you were going to have. And I was really unsure about what to do with my career. I had a good job. Uh, on, I'd then been the house press secretary for a while. But I didn't love the Republican leadership at the time. I didn't want to move into that world. I didn't want to be a lobbyist. I wanted an adventure, and I wanted to meet somebody. I wanted to have a life partner, but just like hardly anyone to date in D.C., um, which I felt bad about saying because some of the guys are a little offended. But I just didn't find the right one for me. And I had a church group, uh, Lutheran Church of the Reformation. We had a singles group, and we got together every Wednesday. And I went there, and there was this woman there. She was slightly older, around 40. And I remember you know, she was kind and didn't uh, berate me for saying I felt old right. you know, at 25. 25 right. And she listened to me and she said, remember what God says. He says, fear not. And you are not forgotten. You are written, your name is written on the palm of his hand. Mm -hmm. And she said, she advised me to write down a piece of paper, fear not, and to carry it with me, either in my pocket or in my purse or something, so that if I felt like I was racked with anxiety, I could just hold on to that piece of paper, read it, and just remind myself. Well, two months later, I was on a plane. It was the last two, my husband and I, uh, comes my husband, he and I were the last two people to get on the airplane. And I remember flying from Denver to Chicago, looking out the window and saying, okay, Lord, I know I asked you to help me find somebody, but he lives in England. He's 18 years older than me. He's been married twice before. Did I mention he lives in England? Mm -hmm. This can't be happening. And I could have talked myself out of it. Um, You're thinking this on the first flight when you just Yes, we had love at first sight. Well, I mean, it really Lord, does happen. I, I want so. everyone to know that it can happen. Um, and I almost talked myself out of it. And yet another family friend says, remember, that God says he wants you to enjoy your life and to find somebody and don't give up on the opportunity to be loved. And one of the pieces of advice I give in the book is that choosing to be loved is not a career-limiting decision. It actually was the best decision of, of my life. This theme of God intervening when I was fearful in order to get me to something right. new is also taught to me by President Bush in the Oval Office. Hmm. Uh, at one point, he had called me in the Oval Office at 6.40 in the morning in the spring of 2008. He heard I was upset about a book my predecessor, Scott McClellan, had written. Yep. And he knew a that I was... A bit of a backstabbing book. It was. For Bush, to, to, it, to President Bush. Bush yes, yeah. and I was upset for President Bush. Mm -hmm. I knew the coverage was very bad. And also, I felt, I hadn't felt as an adult sort of that betrayal of a friend. Mm -hmm. And I was really upset and mm -hmm. almost incapable of doing my job. So the president calls at 6.40 in the morning. They say, he'd like to see you. Okay. So I put on my jacket, and I walk the 30 steps. And he's got his glasses on the end of his nose, and he says, I hear you're upset about this book. Now, he's writing personal letters to families of the fallen. So my problems are like this big right. compared. But he knew that he needed to be a better manager and also to remind me of what I'd been taught as a girl. I said, yes, sir, I'm upset about the book, and here's why. And he said, I'd like you to try to forgive him. Hmm. And I said, mm, can I throw him under the bus first? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, no, I don't want you to live bitterly. Right. And no one's going to remember this book. And he appreciated that I was trying to protect him. What was one of the things I say in, in the book as well is this, the part of history that's not been written yet is the personal side of George W. Bush. What it was like behind the scenes with him, what kind of a man he was, what kind of man of character and strength and gentleness that go hand in hand. So I say, yes, sir, thank you. 
and I was walking out of the Oval Office, and just as I was about to cross the threshold, he calls after me and he says, by the way, I don't think you'd ever do this to me. Hmm. And I realized that's what I was really worried about, that I was going to lose my relationship with him and the trust hmm. if he thought that I was going to write a book later on that would stab him in the back. Yeah. Yeah. And that freed me to be able to do my I job. I couldn't see you doing that ever. I mean, no. Really, <laughs> really. really. You're, you're, I was you know. asked, actually, when I was writing this book, I was asked by somebody that I respect greatly, you know, are you going to try to explain to us all the problems of George W. Bush? <laughs> and I said, oh, no. Uh, this book is about a really great story about how he often, he wasn't just my commander-in-chief and my boss. He was like a second father to me. Really? Mm-hmm. Hmm. And yeah. a, lot of, a lot of the White House staffers felt that way, and I dedicated the book to my Bush administration colleagues for a reason. You guys could put together a really good book if each of you wrote a chapter on what, you know. I have like loved finding aspect. out from former colleagues about, oh, I had a great one, about these stories of President Bush that I didn't know about. A friend of mine who was a former speechwriter heard about my book, and he sent me a note saying that on the day his daughter was born, a big speech was due. And he wasn't there to do the finishing touches, and he felt guilty about that. He's in the hospital. Baby's going to be born any minute. Phone call. It's the White House. The president wants to talk to you. And he thought it was to talk about the speech. And he said, no, it was the president saying, you're having a daughter. And let me tell you, as a father of two daughters, there is nothing that will make you a better man than being the father of a daughter. And he said, don't come back to the White House until you have a chance to enjoy her. Oh, wow. Yeah, so there are a lot of yeah, stories like yeah. that about him. Yeah, great. Last question, i got to let you go. I want you to tell me a little bit about the Mercy Ships experience, why you did that, what you plan to maybe do in the future. Well, if I could start at, in February 2008. Um, President Bush went with Mrs. Bush to Africa. He travels kind of fast. We did a five countries in seven days. Oh, sounds like my dad. <laughs> and he had a lot to do and a lot to see, and it was a big trip. We were talking about the HIV AIDS program, PEPFAR, that the president had um, initiated in 2003. And as press secretary, whenever I was asked about the president's humanitarian aid or uh, about his compassion, I knew all of the statistics. I knew how much money, how many lives saved, how, much, how many medicines had been there. Uh, the Millennium Challenge account, I could tell you all of that. But I had never felt what he felt, which was that we had this moral obligation to help a continent that was about to lose an entire generation of people. So we go on this trip, and I'm totally overwhelmed. And you can, there's something about the travel that it's all, it's all your senses. And you hear and see and you can touch. Smell. Smell. And I felt something in my heart, and I said to my husband, when, I leave the, when we leave the White House, I want to come here for six months. I want, to, I want to understand it better. I want to do something and just get regrounded because the White House can give you a big head and it can make you mean. I remember looking up in the mirror one time and catching a glimpse of myself in the side mirror of the Jeep. And I thought, who is that? I was so angry and hard. And I, I said, that's not who I want to be. And my mom had worked with a lot of refugees, resettling refugees through the Lutheran Church in Denver. Um, so I learned about that. So my husband and I do go back. We worked at an HIV AIDS clinic, a PEPFAR clinic called Living Hope in Fish Hook, South Africa, where it just turned, it made my heart bigger. And every time I went to Africa, it got bigger. So then I get to work on Voice of America. A couple of years later, uh, I found out about Mercy Ships, which is a surgical hospital ship that serves the forgotten poor on the west coast of Africa, mainly. They've been in other places around the world. And I was astounded, and I said, I gotta go see this for myself. And when I first went to Fox, I was worried that if I didn't have ability to travel and to do the things that I cared about, that my opportunities would shrink. But far from it, Fox News, when they heard I wanted to go on its trips with my husband, my husband and I paid for our trip, but they sent us with a camera. And my husband's a total amateur, but we, sh we were able to see that hearts were being healed on this ship. People who had met, 7,000 people in Congo came for assessment day. They had heard about the ship. People had walked for days. People who had never seen a, a, a doctor. And they couldn't help everybody. But they, ser they served all, so many people. And they don't waste a dollar on the ship. We stayed there for four days. They're all kind to each other. I was interested to find out how they raise money to be able to pay for their own ship's fees. Um, it was a beautiful experience for me. It's not sad to me. My, 
my heart is broken for some of the things that are going, people are going through, but I saw these doctors and nurses and people who are volunteering and giving their lives over in the name of God in order to help the forgotten poor. And it changed me. And so when we did the book, the pre-orders for the book, um, for a few days, there was a big push that anybody who bought the book during that time, I would donate a portion of those sales to Mercy Ships because I know that they use the money wisely and they're really making a difference in the world. Mm -hmm. Great organization, I appreciate you being a part of it. Thank you. Um, keep doing the good work on the air and mm -hmm. wherever you may be. Thank you. And uh, check her out at danaparino.com. Do pick up her book and the good news is it's a good read, inspirational story. We appreciate you coming by. Thank you.